Welcome to this special series and I'm so excited to be bringing you the awareness and the tools and the knowledge to ensure that you can thrive after narcissistic abuse. And with all of these special resources and my book being released over the next few coming weeks, myself and the MTE team hope to help bring forth awareness of narcissistic abuse and most importantly, the tools to help people heal from narcissistic abuse into the mainstream. And to help us make this extraordinary impact, we'd love you to get involved by leaving your own comments and questions and sharing this content far and wide. So my book, which is You Can Thrive After Narcissistic Abuse, is available mid-November. And to find out the details uh, and pre-order your copy, you can go to youcanthrivebook.com. So I'm so excited today because we're going to be doing an amazing interview, which is about the Empress Guide to Healing After Narcissistic Abuse. And today to discuss this topic with me, I have a beautiful lady who's also uh, a dear friend and colleague who has been so inspirational in the world with her book that she's doing, which is uh, just incredible work. So I have the wonderful and lovely Dr. Christiane Northrup. And Christiane Northrup, MD, she is a visionary pioneer and a leading authority in the field of women's health and wellness, which includes the unity of mind, body, emotions, and spirit. And she's internationally known for her empowering approach to women's health and wellness. And she teaches women how to thrive at every stage of life. So Dr. Northrup is an internationally respected writer and speaker whose books have been translated into 24 languages. She's a multiple New York Times best-selling author with incredible books such as Woman's Bodies, Woman's Wisdom, The Wisdom of Menopause, Goddesses uh, Never Age. I love that one. And so <laughs> many, <laughs> I stand for that one. And so many others, which are recognized now as the global Bibles for women's health. So you've got to look up her stuff if you haven't. It is just astounding. And Dr. Northrup's most recent book, which is Dodging Energy Vampires, an Empress Guide to Evading Relationships that Drain You and Restoring Your Health and Power was an immediate success, which is not surprising. And in this, Christiane provides incredible strategies for how you can recover your health after a relationship with an energy vampire. So it is my absolute joy to connect with Christiane and I did a little time ago because she found out about my work and the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Program because a dear friend of hers had been through uh, this level of abuse and had recovered with the program and since that time we've done a few interviews together, uh, most recently on Hay House Radio. And Christiane, I love your energy and I love your passion and your approach to healing. And I, I do feel like you're a really deep soul sister in this mission to help people heal from narcissistic abuse. I know we're both very passionate about that. So thank you so much for your work and also for your involvement in my book uh, with the foreword. And for today, where we're going to have a look at the Empath's Guide to Healing After a Narcissistic Relationship. Thank you for joining me. Yes, my pleasure. My pleasure. You know, the fact that we're doing this uh, in the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere, we've kind of got the globe covered and none too soon because this mm -hmm. problem has been going on for thousands of years, for centuries. And it's only now that we've had the language, the brain scans, the uh, awareness to deal with it. Because for centuries before this, the people, the empaths just thought they were crazy. And the other people with the gaslighting and, and so on always came out on top. So really, this is the first time in recorded mm -hmm. human history 
where these characters are being held accountable because we finally have the knowledge. And, you know, with their flying monkeys and all that, the flying monkeys do not seem to have the surfaces to land on that they used to. <laughs> so, I love that. It's so mm -hmm. true. It's exciting times. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It so yeah. is. So is. So, Christian, mm -hmm. just for people that may not know or kind of understand, how would you describe an empath? Okay. An empath is somebody who walks into a room and feels the room with their body as the sensory instrument. And often we can't tell the difference between where we end and they begin, but there's more. We also, many of us are very, very old souls. So our very energy field begins to be an air purifier for the room. And the problem is if you're born this way as a little kid, and your parents do not understand your sensitivity. You think that something is wrong with you. And mm -hmm. that's not the case at all. And we are the people who are preyed upon by uh, energy vampires because where there is great light. So you turn on a light outside, right, at night. What happens? All the moths come to the light. So empaths. Have, they're extremely sensitive to energy. They feel when someone else is sad, they start to cry. When someone else is angry, they suddenly feel angry out of the blue. And if you don't know what that is, you begin to blame yourself. And then also people tell you, you're too sensitive. You're being too sensitive. When in fact, that's who you are and it's a gift. And so empaths are also generally... They are healers, they are midwives, they're herbalists. We're drawn to the healing arts because we feel into others in a way that uh, the average person does not. So that's what an empath is. And Carolyn Mace, the world-renowned medical intuitive, calls the empath the new normal. The new normal. Wow. Yeah. I love your description of that. And I know that so many people in my community are empaths who have been through yeah. narcissistic abuse because generally they're really lovely people who want to make a difference, want to do the right thing, want to, want to help others. So I think that's, you know, that's the big thing about empaths is that we want to help other people, but we've really had to learn how to help ourselves and get our own oxygen mask on first. Well, the other thing about us that's just key, we believe this myth that the reason people are energy vampires is that they were hurt in childhood. So we believe, as Dr. George Simon said, who wrote a book called In Sheep's Clothing, we believe that only hurt people hurt people. This is the first thing that an empath, we can't even imagine that. We cannot imagine manipulating, controlling, uh, you know, trying to uh, get people to do our bidding. It's the last thing in mm. our mind. So therefore, Absolutely. we can't even begin to appreciate that someone would do that on purpose and know what they were doing. And that's the first thing yes. we need to learn is that there are people who are not like us. And by the way, it's about one in five people. That's the, that's the number of people with what we call in psychiatry a personality disorder. I agree. A personality disorder is not a biochemical imbalance. It's a moral character problem. <laughs> so true. It is a character issue. And it's terrifying at first when we discovered that, wow, there are people that actually think like that, that operate like that. That's and it. And it can be awful uh, too when we're in a relationship with somebody like that and we start fighting back and trying to survive and then yes. and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm saying that. I can't believe I'm rolling around in this stuff that is not my normal. That's the other thing. So many of us are incredibly skillful at our work, you know, um, 
we are often, you know, CEOs, federal judges, doctors, nurses, teachers, great mothers, great fathers. And we are skilled. We have a big skill set everywhere else except in this one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. intimate relationship because the skill set that we have, the, the super traits, um, work everywhere else in the world. They do not work with an energy vampire, with a narcissist. They mm -hmm. make it worse because what we do we see a situation, we think we can uplift it. Absolutely. So we, we go to fixer-uppers. We can go in and turn around a corporation or turn around a church or a school or, or someone who's um, hurting in our families. You can't do it with a narcissist because they are a black hole. And the more you give, the more they take. And until you are kind of, um, I say with the men who've been in relationship with narcissistic women, many of whom are borderline personality disorder, the, the, the yeah. road is strewn with the carcasses of men who've had the living daylight sucked out of them by a woman who does, you know, help me, you can't. Help me, you can't. It's crazy. It's crazy making. And so the very best people, I mean, the, the ones who have a very high moral character tend to get targeted by these people. So I say in my book, you haven't been chosen. You've been targeted. But because these people have what I call malignant intuition, they see the wound in you and they know exactly what you've been dying to hear your whole life. Oh, you're so beautiful. You're so loyal. You're so, oh, or what they would do to me in my medical practice. Thank God I found you. No one else has ever been able to help me. So imagine I'm there and I'm a holistic doctor and I'm that, that really wasn't accepted by my own profession. So I would have my patients giving me all of this love bombing. And then the minute I turned human, they would turn on me the way it, it always is. And so in any given primary care practice, so family medicine, OBGYN, whatever, it's estimated 25 to 30% of your patient load will be energy vampires, will be character disordered people because they're just there for the narcissistic supply. They're not there to get well. They're there to drain your energy. Wow. I know Gee, it's that, shocking. Wow. That puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Which is such an important message for the healers, the caregivers. Oh, the oh, it is different. so important. You know, I was once in New York and uh, Donna Karen has a thing called, um, oh, she was doing the thing to send, to train people to go into hospitals to do, um, different kind of caring, Reiki and comfort measures and yoga and breathing for yes. cancer patients. And I ha had to give the, uh, a lecture to, at Yoga Journal, sponsored it. And I said to them, it was way before I wrote Dodging Energy Vampires, I said, now, now you all have even more skills to drain yourself dry with. <laughs> so wow. yeah it was called the yeah the urban zen integrative therapist so, so you know imagine yeah the, <laughs> absolutely gosh okay yeah. so the important question is is how can we still give and heal and serve without these people draining us dry the first thing is you recognize that they exist the second thing is this, and you know, you're a giver, I'm a giver. When we get off this call, we will feel energized because we have given and received equally and we've done good work and it's elevated the collective. Yes. With an energy vampire, you will feel drained. Mm. And so I've been with them. Uh, one famous woman uh, who shall remain nameless, but I had lunch at her home, beautiful home on the river, gorgeous. I thought I was going to fall asleep in my soup. It was carrot ginger. It was good soup. But I thought I was going to fall asleep. I'm digging my nails into my hands. They literally, wow. it's like they put a tentacle into you and they're draining your life force. Oh, so so notice how you feel.
Yes. Just notice how you feel. If you feel, um, or you'll be at someone's home and you, you look at the rug because you want to lie down on that rug and take a nap. You just, you, you can't keep your eyes open. It's the poppies in the Wizard of Oz. So notice that. Mm. Or let's say that you are a healer and you have a bunch of people and you look at your, at your patient list for the day, massage therapist, whatever, you look at your list. And you look at a couple names and you go, oh, oh, you know, they're yes. here again. What yes. you want to do with those people. My acupuncturist is Chinese and she says, we just work out of schedule. I mean, so what you try to do seriously is you try to make it far less comfortable for them. Now, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what works a lot of the time. They don't want anyone who has a need. They target you because of your ability to give way beyond uh, the normal human. So if you have a need, like um, I worked with a psychologist and she told me this worked every time. So you get a borderline or someone who is calling all the time. You start to complain about your own health. You just say, oh, I'm just, I'm so sorry. I'm not feeling well. Um, or I've just had a disaster in my family. In other words, you do the thing that they do all the time that you don't want to do because you know people use that as an excuse for not doing their human homework. You've got to consciously do that. She calls it broken wing. Just drag a wing, drag a leg. Wow. Or the other yeah. thing is be less attractive. Just don't be attractive. So that's like uh, yes. the gray rock thing. You just become a gray rock. Yes. Boring, and dull. Benign. Boring and dull. And, and I had uh, one of my readers did that at the office and she said, I was feeling really bad about it. It didn't bother anybody. The only person that it worked with was the narcissist who went away. They, yes. It's shocking to us. We think they love us. We think they like us. Mm -hmm. And they will go away so fast. And I think that that's one of the things with your work and my work is that if we can get someone to recognize this kind of relationship early on, then they won't stay married for 24 to 30 years and then end up, you know, this sort of empty shell with no money at the age of 60. Because that's what I've seen where this, where the woman, it's usually a woman, not always, of course, where you keep trying and trying and trying because again, everywhere else in your life that works. You watch things grow around you. You watch wherever you are flourish. But with these people, you just get drained, drained, drained. You get cognitive dissonance to the point where you don't know what you think anymore. Because here's the belief, okay, cognitive dissonance. You believe all people are good and you're getting treated like crap. Those two things are completely opposite. I, you have the best acronym ever, CRAP. Criticism, rejection, abandonment, punishment. That's yeah. what they do to you. Absolutely. So what you do at first is you think you did something to deserve that. No, you were born an empath. And you were born usually with an inferior ego. And the narcissist has a superior ego. They think they're better than everyone. And you think, well, you, what we do to keep our inferior ego going, we look for things to improve about ourselves. They're already perfect. <laughs> yes, yes. And we're wanting that acknowledgement outside of ourselves from somebody who we think needs to reflect that back to us. You know, yes. if you don't know that I'm a great person, well, how do I know I'm a great person? That's it. That's it. Exactly. The other thing I want to say uh, as a physician is throughout my whole career, I would see these people with so-called autoimmune disease. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, chronic oh, fatigue, gosh. fibromyalgia, all of these. All the time. Every, every single time. Every single time. All the time. Yeah. This person has an energy vampire in their lives. I agree. I yeah. agree. So it doesn't matter. You can do, you can have a perfect diet. You can do acupuncture. You can get massage. You can take mm. herbs. It will not matter until you tell the truth about the one thing that you don't want to look at, which is usually, you know, your marriage or maybe your child or something or your boss. It's the one thing 
you don't want to look at, but you know. So, you know, even as you and I are talking, you know that people are having names come up into their head. And it's like, oh God, not that, not that. Oh gosh, so yes. what we want them to know from your work is you have people from all over the world who have yes. done this work and their lives are better than ever and they can see a narcissist 25 feet away. Like I can see them now. I don't need them in my life. What happens after you do your work, the work that you talk about, the recovery? Yes. You become so radiantly full of yourself mm. that you don't need the constant affirmation. Exactly. And it's so exciting mm. that this, these tools are available now for people. You don't need to live like this. Now, at first, at first, and I had somebody on Facebook say, Oh, I feel like if I cut the cord, I will die. Oh, gosh, you, yes. You feel like that. Is, don't yes. you hear this all the time? Oh, gosh, and I felt like that. And, and yes. People, oh, gosh, yes, absolutely. And you will die to mm. your old self. Mm. And I think what, I, what I've always loved about your work is you focus on the only life you can change or save, which is your own and, and, you know, we like to blame the narcissist, but in a way, it's, it's kind of a marriage made in hell. It's work that we have to do on ourselves. So what I did in the acknowledgments of dodging energy vampires, my very first acknowledgement was to all the energy vampires I have known over the years, because without you, I would not be who I am. You see, so at this point, I know who I am. And I am, uh, you know, now I don't, I don't claim to be vampire proof, but here's what I do claim, that I've got a couple of really good friends and I say to them, look, if you see me doing it again, stop me. Do not, you cannot wait three years to say to me, hey, we knew that already. Yes. No, no, no. I said, you don't get any credit for that. You got to tell me right away. Right. And you know <laughs> right. what? A good friend tells the truth. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh gosh, I so agree with you and everything you're saying. And I love how you're saying that, well, we can't change them. And it's really exhausting walking around in life and going, well, if only I could change, the, you know, the billions of people and the billions of situations. <laughs> and we actually right. can't. The only thing that we can change is ourselves. And as that empath, it, we didn't realize that we were sourcing our love, approval, survival, and security outside of ourselves. And when we heal all those old wounds and sure it up, when we get the love bombing, we don't go, oh my God, this is, I feel like a woman or a man in a desert getting a drink. Now, oh, that feels a bit off on the inside. That doesn't feel genuine. Okay, I'm going to check that out. I'm going to show up in my power. What I love about energy vampires and narcissists is that they'll come along and they'll look for your weak link. They'll go, okay, well, where are you insecure or what's hurt you in the past? Because I'm just going to pretend to be that thing so that you go, oh, my God, you are it. You, you're the best thing since sliced bread that's come into my life. And I remember, you know, when I was dating that mm -hmm. men would question me trying to find my gaps and the old me used to go, oh, my God, he did this, he did that. And I'd go, well, I'd never be like that. Like, I just, I don't do any of that, you know, and I'd fall for it. But what would happen is narcissists would look for my gap and I'd go, no, look, I'm great. Like, I'm, you know, I totally know who I am. I'm in no hurry. I feel really empowered in my own skin. I trust myself. And you could see them doing backflips in their head, trying to work out where your <laughs> gap was to be your biggest and best thing. It's so powerful. And yes, they, they can't suck you in. Right, right. And then what happens is your point of attraction changes. Oh, yeah. So suddenly, now let's just call it, there's this thing, I call it, the time in between. When you're no longer with the narcissist, but your new tribe hasn't shown up yet. Oh, I like how you're talking about this. It's important. That's a real important time. By the way, it's like the time right after chemotherapy. The person will talk about this, where, where when they're in the middle of chemo, 
and they're fighting cancer and all their family has gathered around. There's something really rejuvenating about that. Oh my God, we're in the battle and everyone's with me in this field. But then the doctor says, okay, uh, you know, your treatment's done. It looks good. Uh, you know, you've survived. You don't need to come back for a year. That's when people tend to fall apart. Makes so much sense. Doesn't it? Doesn't so it? for anyone who's there, mm -hmm. this is where you have to have faith, but you have to actually uh, tend that little vulnerable inner child. You have to be the best parent, and it won't be a parent that you actually had in real life, chances are. Totally. And you have the, the way to God, I think, the way to your higher power mm -hmm. is through this little scared inner child. So 100%. you need, you know, you need more love, not less. You need to just really pay attention. Um, and, you know, what would you like from me? What do you need? You need a nap or whatever. And so when you're feeling, Gay Hendricks wrote a really a great book, How to Love Yourself, years ago. And here's, what, here's the whole formula. You find something about yourself, like you're sad or you think it's too late for you or you think, oh, I should have stayed married because I only had, you know, we had 25 years in and now it's not worth it or any of those things. You take that part of you and you love it. You love the part that's not lovable. It's paradoxical. You say, I love myself for that doubt. I love myself for that anger. I love myself for this grief. And then it just dissolves because shame and fear, especially shame, shame cannot live in light and humor. So that's the other thing you want to do. Do some fun stuff. I mean, go to funny movies. Uh, do anything like that to lift yourself up because you've got to move from the head here down to your heart. And it's a million mile journey um, when it's about loving yourself. And you got to kind of pedal there for a while until it becomes an energy field that is very stable in your body. And then you'll find that whole new people, a whole new tribe comes into your life. A whole new life is Absolutely. waiting. Remember Joseph Campbell had that great quote, we must be willing to release the life that we have had in order to have the life that is waiting for us. Oh, it doesn't that give you goosebumps all it over. It does. Yeah, it I does. I yeah. love that. And I love that shift. You know, for me, with a, with a massive trauma of narcissistic abuse, you know, what I found for me was that, you know, my old things weren't working because it was game over. You know, when you're on your hands and knees and dribbles coming out the corner of your mouth, it's kind of I like, know, right. it, it's like, okay, wow, like I don't think I'm going to just get up and get on with this, which is what the empathy is so good at doing. We're so resilient, resourceful. And, yes. Oh, and, and it was game over, you know, and that Joe Dispenza talks about that where he says that's the point of personal catharsis when it's game over. So, yeah. you know, for me, finding, I love what you said about getting out of the head into the body and in the body, finding a way to release that trauma so that my inner being was not like a Beirut war zone. <laughs> And then, you know, organic healing and well-being and good feelings and, you know, joy and love for myself, which I believe is our true state without trauma, could yeah. start to finally, finally be my normal. And, you know, that's what, if it had never been for narcissistic abuse, I would never have got there. I would never no. have been forced there. Well, we, you know, we would have been, I mean, imagine. Okay, so let's say that you had married someone who was, not a narcissist, but you know, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My first so boyfriend, you... <laughs> that would have been him and I'd never be doing this. Yes. Yes. I had a couple of boyfriends who were like that. It would have lovely. been very, very lovely, very easy. That's not what you and I were born for. We, oh, we, no. we were born for something else. And so we had to have our teeth cut on these dark characters that we thought mm. we could heal. But as a result, don't you think? I mean, I feel like I've brought in so much more light, so much more uh -huh. light as a result. Yeah. 
soul level, we planned it perfectly. And I think that empaths really are, you know, angels that are submerged into the darkness to be able to anchor the light in for themselves and the collective and bring forth heaven on earth. I really believe that this is our mission. That's true. And that's what we're doing right now right now because we are we're like in the you know in the end times and when they say the end times Mm. that that just means patriarchy as you know war going to war recovering from war having some blowhard with a big ego absolutely a whole bunch of people to go to war no Mm. we know that's what the end we got to stop that we've got to stop that and the only way to stop it is to trust yourself enough to say, oh no, that doesn't feel like a good idea to me. So fear is no longer our primary fuel because darkness uses anger and fear as fuel. And so when you are no longer afraid, when you're no longer angry, Mm -hmm. then you become uh, full of light and you become in a way vampire proof. They can no longer do anything to you. I I know when, Mm -hmm. you know, somebody... I grew up in an athletic family and they were all like, you know, major athletes. And part of the way that my childhood was is because I wasn't like that, they would try to, you know, shame me about you're not working hard enough, you're not hiking enough. So later in life, when I've done various athletic yoga things or whatever, I had a a, a trainer who started to do the, oh, come on, you know, you're not working hard, you're this, you're not this. I looked at him and I go, Bob, Bob, really? You, I've had so much of that. There is no way you will ever motivate me by calling me a weakling and that I'm not, it just does. It doesn't work. This is never, you think you're going to motivate me with that. I'm so over that. It will never work for me. That's the old paradigm. It's the old paradigm, Mm. you know, work out until you throw up. It's yeah, ridiculous. It's you can't ridiculous. shame and blame yourself into shape and health and, and well-being and wholeness. No. It doesn't work like that. No, no, not at all. On the other hand, you do, you do have to do the hard work of oh. waking up and looking in the mirror and saying, I cannot take this another moment. You know, oh, there's gosh, a scene geez. in the movie, uh, The Color Purple. And I believe it's Oprah Winfrey's character and she stands up or maybe it's Whoopi Goldberg and she looks at the guy who's been abusing her forever, for years, who kept her sister's letters away from her. And she looks at him at the dinner table. She stands up and she says, you touch me again and your life will rot. Nothing has changed in the outside. Same thing happened to Tina Turner, by the way, when she told Ike to take a hike. She had one dime. Yes. That's the power wow. of being sourced. Nothing has changed. Mm-hmm. The Department of Human Services did not ride in to save them. They became so Christ. full of their own power. And that's what your narcissistic abuse recovery program does. Mm-hmm. People are literally downloading their own power. And Absolutely. then everything changes outside of you. It sure does. And it is like the metaphor that when you shine a bright light on a vampire, it will recoil back in. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes. Yes. So when we've lent, lent inwards and healed those uncomfortable, insecure, underdeveloped parts of ourselves that we'd rather not face, once we heal them up into a healthy whole adult. We show up so honestly and authentically. If somebody's saying something or doing something off, we confront. We bring it out into the open. We shine that light and you will see the vampire unravel in front of you and you'll go, whoa, that's actually somebody who I don't want to hang with and play with and do business with or love with because you're really not a nice person. Yeah, yeah. And not nearly, I mean, they get like a deflated balloon. You know, when they're not, when people aren't paying attention to them, there's not, they don't have much to offer. It's very interesting. And it's really interesting in conversations because they can keep trying to bring it back to self, back to self, back to self. And other <laughs> people are kind of looking at and going, well, you know, you're really boring and uninteresting and we're not feeding you. And then they're like, they just have to exit the scene or go really quiet or create a drama or something 
because it's not, these are people that it's all about them. And that's a really good warning sign. Somebody, if it's all about, you know, you know that mm, this isn't a person to have mutuality and a wonderful uh, cooperative, productive relationship with. One of my friends, this is so funny. She is talking with a man on the phone and he says to her, I'm looking at myself in the mirror. And he said, and the more we talk, the better I look. It was the, I mean, if that isn't it, if that isn't it, so he's literally downloading narcissistic supply from her and his looks are going up. So you should notice that. Yeah, because, you know, many, many celebrities are the people who need to be center stage all the time. Yes. They are using your energy to look good and feel good. And the minute you withdraw it, and so it's also, it's so interesting to me. Um, I have a, you know, an example that I've given where you see a couple in Walmart or a place like that, and she looks all schlumpy and overweight and puffy. He looks like a million bucks. She's the supply. She's like a placenta giving him all of her energy. And as a result, she's depleted and puffy but she's the source and she's feeding him so the minute she clamps the cord he becomes nobody now here's the thing that's very hard for people to they a good empath can't believe this and that is the minute you finally get it and you clamp the cord and you leave this relationship i said this to a friend of mine i said now listen are you prepared Mm -hmm. For when you ask for a divorce, Mm -hmm. are you prepared for this guy to be with another woman within 15 minutes or so? Oh, gosh, yes. And she goes, yeah, I'm prepared. And it was still hard Mm -hmm. because, of course, the guy found a a much younger woman who's an heiress. So the one thing that uh, narcissists love is they love status, looks, and money. That's what they're after. Exactly. Because it's parasitical. That's it. Yep. Mm, Yep. I totally. Well, Christy, it's been, as always, incredible having conversations with you. I love your insight and I love your direct honesty. It's so empowering. It totally is. So how awesome that we can do this together and raise awareness and, and, and help people wake up the way that we've been able to wake up. That's it. Exactly. We exactly. So you. thank you for your work. Okay. Good. Oh, good. So thank you, Christiane. You're welcome. So I hope that you found this uh, interview really inspiring and interesting and insightful. And I'd love you to share your thoughts and your comments and your questions because I'm sure you've recognized a lot of you out there, a lot of stuff with what Christiane and I've talked about because we love in this community engaging in those really rich discussions about these topics. So that's good. And please know you can thrive after narcissistic abuse. My new book, which is so exciting is available for pre-order. Now, all you need to do is go to, you can thrive book.com for all of the details. And I just want to say my deepest gratitude to everybody here who is leaning, uh, watching this, and leaning into your self-development and healing for yourself, our future generations, and our planet to put a stop to abuse and abused. That's the mission. So thank you everybody so much and lots of love. Bye-bye.